Welcome back, everybody. I'm glad that you came back to our second week of membership class. Um, if you have um, any questions, again, you can contact me on my email at pj at diversitychurchindy.org. Some of the most common questions we get in these classes are, hey, if I have to miss one, is that all right? I probably should have covered this in the first one, but that's all right. If you have to miss one, we will get you the information. We can send you the video that you need so you can watch it. We do believe it's good to be in the class. You get to meet the other new members next to you. Matter of fact, you should say hi to one of the new members that are that's joining this class with you. Get to know them, that type of thing. Um, connect with them. You know, take them out to lunch or or coffee or have them over at your house, something like that. Be great. Again, we're building the core values that we talked about. One of them is relationships, like we talked about last week. We also are talking about the vision of where we're going. We need to do that together. Jesus called disciples to do life together, and then they went out and they accomplished the vision that He had set out for them. The vision of God is always connected to somebody else in your life. And so the person next to you might be that person. I'm not just talking about the people that came with you. I'm talking about the people that are on the other side of the room and that type of thing. So if you need to miss a class or that type of thing, we can get you to that. But please come. We want you to be connected uh, to this and that type of thing. Um, and then the third week of the class, we will have you come up forward in church because... Uh, we want to recognize you as a member. And I always joke with all of our members at this point, like we're going to make you recite the whole vision statement. You have to, you have to memorize it all. No, I'm totally kidding. Um, that is not anything we're going to make you do. We're just going to actually have you come forward um, after worship in our service on the third week after that third uh, class during church service that week, whatever church service you go to. That week, you're going to come forward, um, generally right after worship, and we're going to honor you by praying for you and just welcoming all the new members to our congregation. It's just a great way to show everybody that the church is growing, that God's adding to it, and uh, just so people can recognize who you are so that we can all connect a little bit better together. And so remember, the third week, so next week, um, we're going to have that time where we come together and come up forward and just have a good old time uh, praying for you guys. You won't have to say anything, so don't worry about all that. Um, you just are going to be prayed for, and we're going to pray for you at the front of the congregation. All right, so this week, one of the things that we want to talk about is our beliefs in our Constitution and bylaws. So when you came in this morning, you should have gotten one of these, this long uh I don't know how many pages, 23-page document about how this church is governed. It is a, um, it's an organizational document, kind of like the Constitution of the United States, um, and, and the bylaws are kind of like the, um, you know, the amendments and things like that in the United States to show who we are, um, kind of what we were designed to and organized for, um, how we're governed, who are the officers of our church, and... Um, members or what your guys' uh, rights are as members, things like that. We have this as an organizational document because we believe doing everything like Paul the Apostle says in 1 Corinthians 14, decently and in order. We believe in order. We believe in structure. We believe that things should be done in a way where, where, where one guy isn't just like embezzling money. And we've heard all the stupidity, I guess, for lack of better words, in church and church history of people that are just doing all sorts of terrible things in the name of God. They don't have any accountability or anything like that. That's why Diversity Church has created this. And that's why we have a board of directors. We have uh, a board that consists of four members, three members, minimally up to four members, uh, plus myself or the lead pastor of this organization. And that board uh, meets once a month. That's also shared in this document. Uh, we meet once a month to go over our finances. Uh, one of the things about our finances that you would find in here, um, if you really want to look through this document, is that nothing that we spend over five hundred dollars will ever. Uh, everything that is spent over five hundred dollars has to be approved by the board. And so that's one of the ways we have a check and a balance. Again, we go over our finances every single month. We have a budget that we're working with every single year. Just so that you guys know, there's accountability here. There's structure here. Um, this is a safe place to invest. This is a safe place to get connected because, again, there's accountability and that type of thing. We don't have any crazy outlandish rules for membership. Uh, we believe that if you just believe um, 
you know, the Constitution and bylaws, the way we, we got it, which is nothing, anything crazy. Um, basically, our core beliefs, that's what we're really going to be going over today. If you believe in those things and you can submit to that, look, you're, you're, you're a part of our church. And this is really um, becoming a member of our church, especially within the Constitution and bylaws, is more about you guys uh, becoming a voting member. So every year we have a business meeting before the end of October, generally right in the beginning of September, we have a business meeting at the main campus and we vote in new board members and uh, we're gonna have to do that again this next year, um, uh, every two and three years, I should say. And um, our th there's a two-year term for two board members. There's a three-year term for two board members. And so again, those things come up. There's um, other things that you would have to do if we're gonna buy any other piece of land, things like that. We want your say. This is your church. We are the church. And so that's the membership voting rights that you would have on some of those business meetings if you would like to be a part of those. And so that's what some of those mean. Um, and so again, we want you to believe like us and that's why the main portion of this Constitution and Bylaws goes over our beliefs. And that's what I'm gonna do today, just break down our beliefs. One of the questions I get during this portion of our membership class is some people might come from a different denominational background. Uh, our church, Diversity Church, is connected with the Assemblies of God. Now, the Assemblies of God is a fellowship, and so what that means is really it's a part of people that are um, credentialed through a fellowship of people that believe the same 16 fundamental truths that we're going to be talking about today. It's kind of our core doctrine, kind of what makes up the things that I'm going to be preaching on a regular basis are these 16 fundamental truths. We believe these are things that we see very clearly in the Bible. We see them over and over again, that, that Scripture interprets Scripture in this way over and over and over again. And so um, these are the 16 fundamental truths that connects other ministers that are credentialed through the assemblies of God. The Assemblies of God, when we first started our church, just to give you a background, I was looking for a church that kind of believed some of the same things that I believed. I went through a, um, a Bible college that had some of these same, probably all these same 16 fundamental truths. And so I was looking for an organization to connect to that was going to help me kind of operate in the things and, and be able to preach the things that I really felt like were really scripturally accurate and scripturally foundational. And so the Assemblies of God are so, is someone that I wanted to connect with, a group that I want to connect with. They're not a denomination in the sense that it's a top-down thing where they govern each and every church. Um, there's no um, governance from the Assembly of God office here in Indiana for our church. Um, like, they don't, like they don't come in and say, oh, you can't do this or you have to do this. Uh, we don't pay any money towards them or anything like that, um, that, that, that we have to just to be a part of them. So nothing like that. It's more of just a fellowship that we can connect and share life on life with other people and, and also to provide accountability for the lead pastor. You'll see some of that in here. If anything ever went haywire with me, if God forbid something happened to me, then they could help facilitate finding a new minister, somebody else who's credentialed with the Assemblies of God. So again, we know somebody's preaching the same things that we believe. Um, but when we started, um, we raised 30 grand and a part of the church planting funding, um, at least here in Indiana at the time we started, they helped us get started with giving us a $30,000 grant. And uh, that was a part of how we got started. And then they served, some of the leadership at the district office served as our board, uh, myself and two members of them of their um, of the district leadership served as our board for the first few years until we got established enough to create our own board. And so that's the, the connection that we have with them. They've been awesome working with. I don't know if you've had a negative experience with Assemblies of God in your past. I hope you haven't. If you did, just know that each Assemblies of God church is run independently. So if they were a negative. Uh, Example for you of AG, just know um, that each church has their own leadership. So it must just have been a negative leadership where they were at. I hope that you don't judge that book by that cover um, because, again, God in this organization, what I have found, is free to move individually through each and every leadership in each and every church. And so, um, and again, through through the members that are a part of that. So you are now Diversity Church. If people have a negative example of our church, you could probably look inwardly and say, what do I need to do to change so I can reflect a better version of our church? And so anyway, I just wanted to give you an example of that and kind of a background of how we got started. Um, 
and then give you an idea of what these 16 fundamental truths are. So you can look with me, um, you can turn the page and go into the tenets of our faith, and I'm gonna just break these down just so that you have an idea of what these fundamental truths are. If you disagree with any of these things, you can still even be a member of our church. We would just ask that you wouldn't um, spread division, you know, that you wouldn't take what we believe to be just foundational and, and try to preach something different. Uh, we would just ask that you would just be respectful of these beliefs because these are our, these are our non-negotiables. We're very colorful. You've seen on our last page, the diversity, welcome to diversity um, flyer that you guys got last week. It's bright, it's colorful, all of those things. But when it comes to our constitutional policies, it's black and white for a reason. These are things that are non-negotiable. So we would ask that you'd be respectful to these beliefs. And if you have questions about them, we would love, again, to sit down with you, have coffee with you, um, just share with you why we see that these are scriptural things. And I'm going to try to do that a little bit right now. Um, the first tenet of our faith, very first thing, is foundational in our faith, is in our, in, our, in our beliefs, is that the scriptures, the Bible, is inspired by God. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17, that it says all scripture um, is given by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and it, it is designed for uh, reproof and rebuke and exhortation in our life. It is designed to just guide us and lead us in our life, but it's God-breathed. It's God-inspired, that the Bible that we preach out of every single week, that, that we believe is the very word of God that God inspired it. There's another scripture in 2 Peter 1, 21 that says that men of God of old, they, they were inspired by God and moved by God to write these things. I say this many times when I'm describing whether uh, man wrote the Bible or God wrote the Bible. Maybe you've had that question. I want you to think about this. Do you write a research paper or does your computer write a research paper? I, I want you to think about that because that's how I believe we can understand how God wrote the Bible. God literally inspired it. It was his thoughts. It was his, it was his word. He just used man as the instrument. He used mankind as the computer, if you will, to, to convey his message. And so if you look at Genesis through Revelation, the 66 books that make up our Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, you can see that there is one theme throughout it that shows how inspired it is. That It's the fall of man, the redemption of man, and that's where we can kind of get into the um, next tenets of our faith. Uh, one of the other things that we believe, the second fundamental truth, is that there is one true God. There's one true God. So we don't believe in multiple deities. Um, there's some other religions of the world, like Hindus, for example, they believe in thousands or millions of gods. Uh, we don't believe in that. There's other, um, there's there's so many different uh, religions out there that, that believe there, there's there's multiple gods, obviously Greek mythology and some of that stuff. You can you can trace back to that. There's all sorts of pagan ideas. That there's so many gods out there and that type of thing. We believe that the Bible, again, going back to our first fundamental truth, that the Bible teaches that there's one true God. And you see throughout the scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, that this one true God reveals himself in three persons. We have Father Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's where we get the Trinity. We are a church that believes in the Trinity, that there is uh, one God, one true God, but you can see him very clearly expressing himself in three different persons, three different people. And you can see that as Father, as Son, and Holy Spirit. You can see that in Matthew 28, 19, when Jesus told um, the church to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We can see later on in 1 John, I believe it's 1 John 4, 5, it says that there's three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. You can see Jesus, when he uh, was being baptized in water, you have the Father saying, this is my beloved Son, Jesus. So you got Father, Son, and whom I'm well pleased. And then you have the Holy Spirit descending upon him like a dove. And so you can just see the Trinity throughout the scripture, even in Genesis 1, where the Bible says, God said, let us, that's that triune nature, let us make man after our image and on our likeness. 
so the Trinity was at work in creation in the very beginning. You can see this throughout the scripture. And so you can look at some of those, but we believe in the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Third belief that we have is that we believe in the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so some people said, well, Jesus is just a good man. Some people just say, you know, he was just a, a spirit, things like that. You see that First John goes and talks about the Antichrist spirit teaching all sorts of lies and, and that type of thing. And, and, and there's always been, okay, he might be a good man or, oh, he's just a spiritual thing. He never really came or those type of things. No, we can see that Jesus was fully man, but he was also fully God. You can see that in who he is throughout the scripture. And you can look at his virgin birth, his sinless life, his miracles, his, his work on the cross and what he did, his bodily resurrection from the dead, um, his exaltation at the right hand of God, how he was actually um, worshipped by people at different portions of his ministry. And if he wasn't God, that was blasphemy. So people would fall on their face and worship him after he would perform a miracle. And there was other times like when uh, he showed up to his disciples after he died and rose again and they were all in that one place and uh, uh, Thomas came in and Thomas finally saw him because he didn't see him the time before and Thomas came in and he fell on his face after he saw Jesus' resurrected body and he says, you are my Lord and you are my God. There's deity in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we can worship Jesus. That's why we can glorify Jesus. That's why the Bible says every name or every knee shall bow to Jesus and every tongue shall confess the name of Jesus, that he is Lord. The Bible says there's no other Savior given among men whereby we must be saved. There's Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. If you do a study throughout the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you will see those three things, the same characteristics, like um, the Prince of Peace in the Old Testament. Well, Jesus said he's the Prince of Peace. You, you can see um, um, all these names of God, the healer. Look what Jesus was doing. Jesus said one time, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I can go on and on and on to share with you uh, on how Jesus really is um, the, the Son of God, but he really is God in the flesh. And let me talk to you about the fourth belief. The fourth belief is that we believe the fall of man. Now, you don't really have to look too far. You don't even have to look into scripture to see that there is something terribly wrong in this world that we live in and that mankind has truly fallen from what we believe should even be like uh, ideal. Uh, you can turn on your news and just see that mankind is not what mankind should be. You can see the fall of man very clear just by looking at the, at the world around us and even looking inside at our fallen nature, our sinful nature. Why is it that we have to teach kids to be good and we don't have to teach kids uh, to be bad? Like kids become bad, like they, they, they just do bad things naturally because it's inside this fallen nature. There is a fall of man. And where did this come from? Where, why is the world the way it is today? Why is mankind the way that we are today? It's very clear found in Genesis, in the beginning of the Bible and throughout the scripture. In Romans, you can even see, see in Romans 5. In Genesis, it, it goes back to Adam and Eve and the first man and how they were told by God not to eat of the fruit of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil. And when they ate of that fruit, the Bible says the day that they would eat it, they would surely die. And that meant a separation from God. And God, who is our life and our source, we're made by him and for him. The moment you're separated from that source, you begin to die. If he is the vine and we are the branches, the moment the branch is taken away from the vine, the Bible says we can do nothing. We can't bear any fruit. Any good out of our life is now uh, subtracted because we're not connected to our source. And that's what happened with Adam and Eve. And from that moment on, you can see in their kids even, Cain and Abel, that's when the first murder happened. You know, Cain killed his brother Abel. You can see then after that, just the tragedy. Even look at the, the flood itself. If you wonder where all of the... Um, uh, tragedies, the earthquakes and tsunamis that you hear about happening in the world, the tornadoes and the natural disasters and the different hurricanes and all that stuff that happens in this earth. All the evil you know, all the pain you've ever experienced in your life, you can take it back and you can, and you can take it all the way to this original sin and how mankind fell from God's design. And here, here's the other thing. We want to blame Adam and Eve. Like, good job, guys. But here's the other thing. If you were them, you probably would have felt too because the Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
that that nature passed on from Adam. The Bible says through one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. So that sin has passed on to all of us, and that's why we see the negative thing. And we would have done it probably if we were in their shoes. We can't blame them. But here's the good news. It goes to our fifth our fifth core belief, our 16th fundamental truth, is the salvation of man. So death has passed into this world by that one man, Adam. But here's the good news is there was a second Adam, and his name is Jesus. And he came to save mankind. We had fallen from grace. We had fallen from God's standard of perfection that he had created in the garden. And we've all sinned and we've all come short of his glory. And we, and we all had done something terrible in our life. And we all felt the result of that. We've all tasted death from maybe a loved one that's passed away or that type of thing. We all know that it shouldn't be the way it is. Yet, God had a plan even though we had sinned. The Bible says, you know, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Jesus, one sin came through one man, but here comes the salvation through the second man, Adam, or the second Adam, Jesus. And so he came to save mankind. And aren't you thankful for that this morning? That Jesus Christ came to save sinners, which Paul said, I am chief. That Jesus Christ came to save you right in your middle of your mess. The Bible says, while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. That yes, we were separated from God through all of our wicked works, but Jesus Christ came to, to pay for your sins when he died on the cross. And that's why, as I said just a little bit ago, that's why he's the only name given among men whereby we must be saved. It's the name of Jesus. You guys got me preaching already this morning. You got me preaching because this is good news. It's almost too good to be true news that we were a sinner. We, we deserved judgment, but Jesus Christ came. See, the Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Well, Jesus Christ came to shed his perfect blood. He's the Lamb of God come to take away the sins of the world. He came to shed his perfect blood so that you and I can be brought back into a relationship with God that we lost through Adam in the garden. Aren't you thankful for the salvation of God this morning? And so we believe in the salvation of man. We believe the conditions of that it's truly a repentant heart, which means you've turned to God in your mind saying, I know he's the only thing that can save me. And that we believe there's evidences of that salvation. When you turn to Jesus and you say, you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. There's evidences that will come if you really are saved. And that's the fruit of the Holy Spirit that you can see in Galatians chapter six. And you can see that there's something you love people. There's something else that changes. The Bible calls it a born again experience. And so anyway, that's the salvation of man. Let's talk to you about the six fundamental truth. Let's look at the ordinances of our church. The ordinances of our church. We believe in baptism and water, which you can see in, again, Matthew 28, 19, where Jesus tells his disciples to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. A lot of people that come from different church traditions, they might say, well, um, do you baptize by sprinkling? Do you baptize in immersion? We believe in immersing, uh, immersion. We believe in really just getting our whole body just drenched with, with Jesus. Um, I'll tell you this, that uh, Peter said when Jesus was washing Peter's feet, um, when, when Peter uh, was told by Jesus that if he doesn't wash it, you don't have any part with him. Uh, if, if Jesus didn't wash his feet, Peter was like, all right. Wash my hands, my head, my feet, my whole body. Jesus, you wash it all. So that's kind of the way we believe. It's just a full act of, of faith of going all the way in the water. Here's what it represents, though. We don't believe baptism saves you. We believe that when you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the repentant heart to Jesus to come and save your life, that's when you're really born again. You're saved. You're on your way to heaven. Baptism actually is an expression of that. The Bible says we are buried with Christ in baptism, and then we are raised when we come up out of that water, we're buried with him. When we go under, when we come up out of that water, we are raised to newness of life. Let me ask you guys this. If you guys haven't been baptized in water, then sign up for our next baptism class. If you need to know when that is, you can email me, again, pj at diversitychurchindy.org. We'd love to get you signed up. If you've never been baptized in water, we believe it's the next step of your faith. Uh, maybe you were baptized as a baby or as a kid and you didn't understand. We believe it, it might be a good thing for you to consider doing it again, um, recognizing that now my life has been changed. I've accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. I'm gonna take that step and I'm gonna be baptized 
in water and just express that my old man's gone and my new man has, has come alive. And so that's baptism in water. The second ordinance we believe is Holy Communion. So we have this at the fourth Sunday. Generally, that's the last Sunday of the month. Sometimes there's five Sundays in a month. So we will have uh, Holy Communion um, once a month. The Bible says, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. It doesn't say that we have to have communion every week. Maybe that's a tradition that you come from. We respect that. We honor that. But for the sake of just honoring communion, we just want it to be something that we do once a month or we just focus on that together once a month. We lead up to that together once a month. It's a very holy and a special time. And so I want you to know when we do that, uh, we do remember the Lord's death. We believe that we're partaking spiritually of his body and of his blood. We, we believe that that's um, spiritually speaking, what, what's happening, that his body's giving us new life. He's the bread of life. And, and that juice, when we drink it, it's like uh, a physical expression to remind us of our sins being washed away. And so we do believe in the ordinances of the church. The seventh fundamental truth we believe is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We believe in the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We believe that the baptism in the Holy Spirit is an, a separate experience after salvation. We don't believe it's just a one-time experience. We believe that uh, being baptized or immersed or filled with the Holy Spirit is something that the Bible encourages us over and over again. We see that the disciples in the book of John, you can read the last chapters of John after Jesus rose again from the dead. I told you earlier when he met with uh, or met Thomas and Thomas fell on his face and declared that he is God. In that same portion of scripture, Jesus told them, this is before he was ascended unto the Father that you find in Acts chapter 1, the next book over in the Bible, John and then Acts. It says that Jesus breathed on his disciples and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, that was an experience that I believe was their born-again experience. I believe that was their salvation experience. They saw the resurrected Lord. They believe he died on the cross for their sins. That was their born-again experience. So they received the Holy Spirit into them so that they were born again. They were regenerated by the Holy Spirit himself. So they received the Holy Spirit almost like when God created Adam in the beginning. He created him, the Bible says, out of the dust of the earth. He made this clay you know, uh, vessel. And then God breathed into Adam, and Adam became a living soul. The word spirit literally means breath. It's, the, it's that life force in our body, and that's the breath of God. And so when Jesus died, he rose. He was with his disciples. He breathed on them. They received the Holy Spirit in them. Okay, that was their born-again experience. Now in Acts 1, Jesus says, go to Jerusalem Wait for the promise of the Father, talking about the Holy Spirit, until he, until you're filled. And here's the thing, in Acts 1.8, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you're going to get power to be his witness. So you have this Holy Spirit in you because Jesus just breathed on them just a couple chapters before in the book of John. What's this next experience that he's talking about? I believe that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and you see that um, throughout the book of Acts, you see that throughout the scripture itself, um, there is a separate experience you can have when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. I heard a, a preacher, um, as a matter of fact, it was earlier today, they were talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, kind of like a kernel of corn, like popcorn, and how each popcorn kernel has like a little bit of water on the inside, like a, just a speck of water on the inside of every single, single popcorn kernel. So then when you put in the microwave or you put on the pan, when you heat those kernels up, that little water begins to get hot and the force of that water and the steam of that water, when it gets hot, when that thing pops, then the whole outward person begins, or the whole outward seed begins to change. We all like popcorn. How many of you guys like popcorn? Well, what happens when the Holy Spirit comes upon you is kind of the same thing. It heats up what the Holy Spirit is on the inside of you. If you've been born again, it's like Jesus breathed into you. You became a brand new person. You're a new creation in Christ. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is to heat up, if you will, that Holy Spirit that's in you. 
like the Bible says, you've been sealed to the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is like that thing. It's like popcorn kernel getting hot inside of you in order to burst so that everything on the outside begins to change. You look more like Jesus. You act more like Jesus. So you have power to be Jesus' witnesses so that even miracles and things like that we see throughout the book of Acts, throughout the Bible, through other people, not even just the disciples, other people that were like, uh, you know, people that bust tables. You see the power of God working through them. We believe that gateway to that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit that can happen to you, just like salvation. Uh, and the evidence, one of the evidences we believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the evidence of, of speaking in other tongues, having a prayer language. Now, again, depending on what background you have, you might think that's a little weird, or maybe you heard some teaching about this topic that was kind of a little bit strange. My wife actually grew up in a fundamental Baptist background, and so uh, for whatever reason, their church just harped on uh, tongues and saying it's of the devil and things like that. That is not lined up with the Word of God. If you look throughout Scripture, and here I'll just tell you some just off the top of my head, you look at Mark 16, the Scripture talks about believers speaking in new tongues. If you look at Acts Two, the believers on the day of Pentecost spoke in other tongues. If you look in Acts 10, the believers, Gentile believers, non-Jewish believers, spoke in other tongues. You, if you look in Acts 19, you can see those believers, um, I think it was in Ephesus, spoke in other tongues. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 12, 13, 14, all talks about speaking in other tongues. If you look at the definition of Acts 14, where it's talking about praying in the Holy Spirit, which is what we believe is release. One of the things that's released is you praying in an unknown tongue to God. If you look at what that definition is in 1 Corinthians 14, then if you look at Romans 8, it talks about praying in the Holy Spirit and how you're praying uh, mysteries to God and how, how he's interceding through you. It talks about mysteries of God in 1 Corinthians 14. Then if you look at Jude, it talks about the same thing, praying in the Holy Spirit. There is just verse after verse and after verse in the Bible that talks about the evidence of this baptism of the Holy Spirit being speaking in tongues. It also will um, be a gateway to the supernatural, so you might begin to prophesy, use some of the other spiritual gifts that you find in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And all of these things are used, again, to edify the body. It's to minister to people, and it's a supernatural thing that God wants in your life. This is something that I believe so wholeheartedly because this has happened to me when I first began to follow Jesus. I was filled with the Holy Ghost, and, and, and I began to operate in supernatural things. I've seen so many beautiful miracles, and I've seen um, all sorts of things. I can tell you over and over again, it was so real in me that when I got an offer to start a church in, um, it was actually in Wichita, Kansas, I was interviewing with a company or an organization, a church organization, and they were going to fly me out there. They were going to give me a year of salary. They were going to give me um, all sorts of cool things to start this church. Well, they did not believe um, in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They did not believe in some of these things that I'm sharing with you now. And I, at the time, um, when I was interviewing with them, I just could not come to a place where I could compromise what I know to be true and what I've seen God do. And I've seen it in my wife. So my wife didn't come from this background. She sought God on her own. It wasn't at a church service. Nobody forced her. She said, God, I want to be filled with your Holy Spirit. And she began to speak in tongues in her bedroom um, after she heard this truth. I don't know what kind of background you have. I don't know if this ever happened to you, but I want you to begin to think that there's more to God than, than you've ever seen that you ever realize. We try to put God in our denominational boxes. We try to put him in our doctrinal boxes. Listen, God is the same, the Bible says, yesterday, today, and forever. If he did something in Bible days, I'm telling you, he's doing it now. If people needed the gifts of the Holy Spirit in that day of Pentecost where the power of God was flowing through the early church back in Bible days, you guys can understand why in our politically crazy time and our, you know, and, and all of the, the riotous living that we, we see our people and our families going through the addiction that's ravaging our streets and our family, you guys can understand why we need the power of the Holy Spirit. This is bigger than just Jonathan Ember. This is bigger than just one person. We need God to, to fill his church so that we can go out and minister to the world in, in a way where, where they can't help us fall on their face, like 1 Corinthians 14 says, and declare that God is in us of a true. And so I didn't compromise in that. I said, listen, 
Um, and this is something I really believe. And they said, well, we might need to part ways and go. And that's where I ended up finding the Assemblies of God because I wanted to join with a group that did believe um, in this right here. And so if you have more questions of that, please reach out to me. Um, the ninth um, 16 fundamental truth is sanctification. Now, sanctification literally means separate, being separated by God. We believe that every believer starts somewhere. Normally, they're at a place where they're far from God, right? And they're living in all sorts of riotous and sinful life, unless they kind of uh, just are a kid and they learn and grow up in the church like my wife did. She got saved at like seven. And trust me, Jesus kept her from a lot of things that I actually uh, uh, ended up going through and sinful behaviors that I had. But sanctification means you go from, you're called out, separated from that lifestyle of sin, and you learn and grow in the things of God to where you're looking more like God. And, and you're growing more in your relationship with God. So we believe in that. Some churches come, and some cultures or, or, or beliefs from some churches say that uh, if you're sanctified, <laughs> um, it's like a work of, like at the same time of salvation, like you're totally perfect. And oh my goodness, what I wish um, and all my counseling and all my other things that that would be the case. But what I know is, is we're all on a journey. And for some of us, it takes a little bit longer to get over certain behaviors or certain habits or certain sinful things in our lives. And so we just believe that wherever you're at in that journey, whether you don't know God, whether you're following God in the beginning or whether you're following him for years, we all are on a journey and we're all growing and going somewhere. And so we want you to feel welcome right where you're at and just know that God's calling you higher. We're going to accept you right where you're at, but God's calling you higher to live the way he's called you to live throughout his Bible. That's sanctification. The tenth one that I want to share with you is the church and its mission. I shared this a lot last week, um, and so I'm not going to go into that when I'm talking about ministries and things like that and uh, just the mission of reaching lost people. Souls is one of our core values, and we believe it's the reason why we exist. There's a reason why we don't have a personal rapture and we go to heaven right away when we get saved, is that God has work for us to do here on the earth, and that's to be a witness, a testimony of Jesus to this lost and sinful world. And so we believe that's the reason we exist. The 11th fundamental truth is the ministry. We believe in the ministry, the fivefold ministry. Uh, we believe in leaderships. We believe the leadership of the church. So we believe like in Ephesians, uh, the Bible says in Ephesians 4 that uh, God has established apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers for the work of the ministry, for the equipping of the saints, the work of the ministry. And so we believe that God has called leaders to do just this. Next week, you're going to take a... Um, a gift assessment, see kind of what area of the church and other outreach or evangelism that God's called you to do. And so we believe in that ministry. Let me talk to you about the 12th fundamental truth. We believe in divine healing. Now, I have not seen everybody I've prayed for get healed, but thank God I've seen some people get healed. I'm not the healer. Jesus is the healer. The Bible just tells me in Mark 16, believers will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And James, the Bible says that um, you know, believers will lay hands on the sick and they will pray the prayer of faith. It says uh, calling forth the elders of the church to pray for the sick. They'll pray the prayer of faith and they will be saved. They'll be healed. Um, there is over and over again, Jesus, everywhere he went, the Bible says, um, he went about doing good, healing those who are oppressed by the devil. So we believe in divine healing. We don't know, I have all the answers on why people don't get healed. We do believe in doctors, that God heals people through medicine. We believe that he'll heal supernaturally. I've seen um, and some of my missions journeys, and even here in the United States, some beautiful miracles. I saw a girl who was deaf and mute speak and hear for the first time and count to three in her native tongue that she had never learned, and it was glorious. I heard, I saw a baby with club feet. Um, God literally straightened those feet, and the mom screamed as loud as she could in a meeting of 10,000 people because her baby was healed in a moment. There is divine healing because God loves people, and he heals people. The Bible says Jesus was moved with compassion, and he healed people. So we believe in divine healing. We also believe in the blessed hope. Uh, we believe that Jesus is going to return one day, and he's going to fix this whole mess. So even though there's a fall of man, and even though he came one day to save us spiritually, there's going to be a day where he comes back. And the, and the Bible says the dead in Christ will rise first, and they're going to be caught up in the air. And those who are, are alive and remain, the other church members that haven't, or, or believers that haven't, um, that haven't died, they're going to be caught up with the Lord, and they're going to so ever be with 
Jesus. That's our blessed hope, and thank God that Jesus is going to come back. And I'm looking forward to that day. The Bible says in Revelation, come, Lord Jesus, come. We are ready for Jesus to come back and fix this mess. It's not in a politician. It's not in a government. It's in the reign of Jesus Christ. We do believe that Revelation, I believe it's 19 and 20, teach about the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. That's the 14th fundamental truth. This is getting into eschatology, some of the end times teaching that we believe there's going to be a millennial reign of Jesus, that he's going to reign in Jerusalem. Jerusalem for a thousand years. The Bible says the devil is going to be locked up for a time and um, and there's going to be a, a physical reign of Jesus. This is what many of the Old Testament believers, the Jews, believe that Jesus was going to do when he came the first time. Um, Jesus obviously fulfilled a lot of those things spiritually, but there is going to be a second time where he's coming to physically reign. The Bible says those who are coming with him, his saints, those who've been resurrected have a new body now, um, or those who are dead in Christ and they got a new body, we're going to come and reign with him on the earth for a thousand years. And then there's going to be a final judgment. There's going to be an Armageddon type of battle. Um, all those type of things that you might have seen or heard in certain movies or even certain portions of scripture, but then there's going to be a final judgment. The Bible says this, and that in Revelation chapter 19, 20, and 21, um, the Bible says that there's going to be this great white throne where God's going to open up a book. Those who are dead uh, are those who have their names written in the book of life. They're going to come into a glorious uh, heavenly experience for the rest of their existence. And then the Bible says those who are, aren't, whose names aren't written in the book of life and it says all liars, all fornicators, all adulterers um, will then be cast into a lake of fire. So those who knew Jesus and those who didn't, basically. Remember, there's only one name given among men where by we must be saved. All those and then all the devils and all the fallen angels, all the evil spirits, they're going to be cast into the lake of fire at the final judgment. And then we will all be in ecstasy forever. And I know you're excited about that. That's the final judgment. And then that's where the new heavens and the new earth come in. Second Peter 3, 13 talks about this earth melting like wax. Then there's going to be a new Jerusalem ascending. Uh, in Revelation, it says that descending from heaven. There's going to be a perfection. We're going to all be with Jesus forever. He's going to uh, right every wrong. He's going to make all things new. And we're going to all be with him in a paradise forever. These are our 16 fundamental truths. This is not everything we believe, everything we preach, but these are our core things that we will not negotiate, negotiate with. These are things that we will not uh, budge in. These are our, our, our 16 fundamental truths. Now, again, if you believe something different, you are welcome to, to even talk to me about those beliefs. We just ask that you don't spread something that is division to what we believe. And so I would encourage you as well to look through this Constitution bylaws. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, I would encourage you just to maybe look at the membership part, look at, um, again, how we're governed, some of our ordinances, things like that. Um, and then uh, if you have any questions, let us know. And this is what basically being a member is all about. You see our vision. You see our values in the culture. You, you believe and know what we believe and that you come with us to accomplish the mission that God has us on. Next week, that's what you're going to do. You're going to take this assessment with one of our associate pastors and you're going to learn about how God's gifted you to help us accomplish this mission of saving this lost world. Thank you again for being with us today. We will see you again next week. God bless you.